This is another iRaw podcast. Just the fact that these sensory capacities fall outside of the human bandwidth to me says that, well, they can experience certain conscious sentience related phenomena, certain experiences uh, in a realm that we can't. So we, we definitely shouldn't hold ourselves up as the sort of gold standard, the, the final word in, in all the sensory experiences that, that creatures can have. Welcome back to The Animal Tone, everybody. This is Season 2, Episode 8. In this season, we are focused in on concepts pertaining to animals and experience. And in this episode, I'm talking to Jonathan Balcom about the concept of shoalmates. Jonathan is a biologist with a PhD in mythology, which, as we've learned from earlier in the season, is the study of animals and behavior. He has taught courses in animal behavior and sentience for the Virtus Graduate Institute and the, and the Humane Society University. He has two upcoming books, one called Superfly, focused in on the lives of flies, and the other, a children's story book about a boy and a fish. His published books include Pleasurable Kingdom, Second Nature, The Exultant Ark, and What a Fish Knows. We're going to be talking quite a bit today about this last book. It is a New York best time seller and is now available in 15 languages. And I have to say that it is an extraordinary book to read. It's extremely captivating, and almost every single page left me gobsmacked the details about not only how fish experience the world but the absolute variety of experiences they have uh, is is just extremely noteworthy and everybody should read it so far in the season we have perhaps been a bit too mammal biased in our consideration of how animals experience the world and in this episode jonathan reminds us that fish or fishes rather deserve such consideration too our concept and focus is shoalmates uh, this concept works to highlight how fish are social animals, but that they also have a variety and complexity of relations to them too. I hope that you enjoy learning about fish, the variety of experiences they have, and perhaps asking yourself how we could be better shoalmates too. Hi, Jonathan. Welcome to The Animal Turn. Thank you so much for joining me. Good to be here, Claudia. I was thrilled when you agreed to do the interview. Uh, I actually immediately went out and bought both uh, two of your books, uh, one Pleasurable Kingdom and the other What a Fish Knows. And I'm about halfway through What a Fish Knows, and it's just brilliant. Thank you so much for the work you do. Glad you like it. It was fun to write. Yeah, you're you're such a great writer. Um, I had Carl Safina and Catherine Gillespie on early on in the season two, and they're also just fantastic writers. All three of you somehow managed to meld both scientific knowledge and anecdotal stories in a way that really just brings animals' lives to the forefront. Um, what got you interested in in animals and animal studies? Well, it starts to have a keen interest in animals themselves, and, and that's nothing new for me. Ever since my earliest memory, I've been completely infatuated with anything to do with animals. Uh, and uh, so writing about them is is re is really exciting and fun, and science is taking such an interest in animals now in a way that they weren't uh, mm. in the last, much of the last century scientists are asking questions about what animals think and feel, which is very exciting and and, and overdue. Um, there was a period in the late 1800s when there was an interest in that, and then science kind of went to sleep on, on those kinds of questions. So, so there's a lot of really rich, uh, interesting information to find in the scientific literature. And now with the internet, one can you sit on one's laptop in a coffee shop or in one's uh, den at home or where have you and and access most of this useful information it also helps to reach out to scientists and to interview them and i, I do a lot of that for my books as well yeah and it's uh, it's wonderful uh, could you maybe tell us a little bit about your backstory what did you study and and how did you come to be an author well i was uh I knew I wanted to help animals in my in my career. There's a, there's a lot of problems with our human relationship with animals, and so by the time I was uh, in graduate school in biology, I knew that's kind of what I wanted to focus on. And uh, towards the end of a, a, a about an eight year stint with the Humane Society of the United States, my then supervisor said, "Why don't you write a, a sort of a, a, a detailed uh, scholarly 
uh, manifesto about the use of animals in education, which is what I was doing at the time. I'd been working on that for many years. So I put that together and, and uh, it was it was a scholarly kind of thing, uh, but it was kind of book length and it made me realize I, I could I could write books and, uh, mm -hmm. and it's something that I really liked doing. So uh, it was a couple of years, I guess it was just a year after that book came out that I had the inspiration for what turned out to be the book you mentioned, Pleasurable Kingdom, and that got me rolling. And I, I really, it's become the most important and enjoyable part of my professional work. Yeah, it, it sounds amazing. Um, early on in the season, I spoke to Mark Beckoff about the concept of cognitive ethology, and he explained, you know, everything it involves and how it involves observations. But you've developed in your, is it, Pleasure Kingdom or Pleasurable Kingdom? Pleasurable Kingdom. Pleasurable Kingdom. Uh, did you develop the concept of hedonistic ethology in that book? Yeah, I would say not. I, I've heard that term before, and it's a it's a nice you know scholarly term. Although I think mm -hmm. most people might not recognize what it means, or many people might not. But uh, um, I, you know, it's my hope that that book helped to stimulate more thinking about and study of the positive side of animals' lives. But one of the reasons I wrote that book was that so much of how we think about and talk about animals is in the negative, uh, their capacity to feel pain and to suffer. Very important, of course, that that be discussed. Uh, but so many experiments and studies done on animals use punishment as a way to, uh, such as uh, restricting food to make them motivated to 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 do the kinds of tests that the scientists want to do on them uh, mm -hmm. instead of offering them rewards, which which has, has gradually become more and more done. But um, just generally, our, our scientific interactions with animals have been, have been negative and our, and our perspective about their lives has been negative. If you turn on the TV for nature documentaries today, you still generally see a lot about the struggle for life, a battle for survival, competition, mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not denying that these these trials and tribulations happen for wild animals, but also there's an enormous amount of l leisure at certain times for certain animals, but certainly pleasure. Um, I think you know nature proceeds by an evolution proceeds by re rewarding animals for what is useful behavior, for what behaviors that tend to promote survival. So, yeah, I I I, I tried to push forward that point repeatedly in that book, Pleasurable Kingdom, and a, and a later pictorial book called The Exultant Ark, which kind of presents these kinds of phenomena in a more visual fashion. So it's trying to, so would hedonistic ethology be kind of the practice of trying to observe how animals enjoy life? Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's so many uh, ways that they can enjoy life. Some of the most basic uh, things that animals need to do to be successful, quote unquote, in their lives. I mean, to, to and to stay alive is to is to get food. Of course, um, we 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 know we find food very in, very rewarding. Um, the taste of it, the smell of it, the, and the this the experience of consuming it. Uh, why should we think differently for other animals? Uh, mm -hmm. Finding shelter. If you're cold, it feels good to get warm. If you're hot, it feels good to get cool. Um, and animals will bask in the sun. They'll lie on cool rocks in the morning. If it's hot, uh, they will, you know, seek water to cool down in, or or find safe places. To, uh, they will build dens. Uh, mm -hmm. And and I just want to add that that's a really critical aspect of it too. Is performing um, work uh, is yeah. is meaningful for animals to build a nest if you're a bird. Yes, there's a lot of instincts at play, but there's also a lot of consciousness going on there. And uh, I didn't mean to, I, didn't, I just realized I just mentioned the word play, which is another very important aspect of, of animals um, learning and becoming effective adults. Play serves that purpose. And, mm -hmm. But the animals are not thinking about Darwinian fitness and evolutionary benefits when they do that. I, I don't think they are. My guess is that they are <laughs> simply playing because it's, it feels fun. It feels fun to do, just as we, we, we do it for that reason as well. Even as you're, you're speaking here, I'm smiling because you're, you're talking about, you know, animals laying on something that's cool when they're hot. And I smile because I can relate. I, you, as you say, we, we know what that relief feels like. And, uh, and we also smile when we see animals in our lives doing these things. Somehow, I guess the extent to which we can 
really know what's going on. Um, you know, people always say, well, how can you really know? But there is a, an intuitive kind of feeling of connectedness when you do something fun together like play. That's right. Intuitive and empathic. The fact that we can experience these feelings uh, means that we kind of have a baseline experience to go on. And then we can use that as kind of the the, the template on which to interpret other animals' behavior. It is, of course, a, 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 an ongoing challenge in studying animals that we cannot completely bridge the gap of privacy, the fact that another individual's experience is, is separate from ours. It's private in the sense that we can't get inside their heads and can't get inside their bodies. Well, we, you know, that, that applies across the board, including within other members of our own species. Of mm -hmm. course, we have the, the benefit of being able to verbalize our experiences and report, it, but verbal, report them verbally, and uh, we, we're more ready to accept that. And I think we should be more ready to accept, accept that, even though one can lie and one can, can try and deceive. Uh, as can animals. But when we see uh, a squirrel, uh, a couple of squirrels chasing each other across the garden, well, it's interesting. I, I mentioned that that example because that's that's an example of the challenge. Challenge: Is it aggressive? Is one ch squirrel angry at the other and chasing the other squirrel? Or are they playing? Uh, and in certain species, in certain contexts, it's it's pretty clear which it is. It's mm -hmm. pretty clear that a behavior is is a is a joyous, positive one, and play is certainly one of the one of the easier ones to spot but um yeah you know there's there's so many ways that animals in engage in behaviors that are a not only important to their survival but b rewarding intrinsically rewarding yeah it's it's beautiful and in in your uh, book which we're probably going to speak a fair bit about today uh, what what a fish knows uh, you focused obviously on on fish uh, or fishes, um, which we'll talk about why you make the distinction. In Pleasurable Kingdom, did you focus on particular species, or was it just a general uh, a general interest in in animals and joy? Well, the the thrust of the book was to was to get across the idea that animals also have fun in their lives. Um, so in that sense, it's a very general um, project and general coverage of the topic. But, but to make the case and to get people engaged and to be convincing, uh, you have to get specific, right? So there's certainly mm -hmm. references to plenty of scientific studies and uh, lots of anecdotes because science at that time and even today, but, it, but it's gotten a lot better even since 2006 when that book came out, uh, sci because scientists by and large didn't study pleasure. There weren't many, weren't a heck of a lot of scientific studies to go on. So, uh, you know, personal experiences and the anecdotes from others and other individuals uh, were were helpful in, in and important in in making that book um, thorough and complete um, with something like uh, what a fish knows which which is was written 10 years later by then um, well and I shouldn't say by then it's a topic that there was a, a, a lot of science that I could draw from to mm -hmm make the argument that fishes are not just unfeeling things they are they are complex sophisticated sentient social virtuous etc there's this whole suite of behaviors that they show um, of course they're a hugely diverse group of animals over 100 over 33,000 described species and probably a few thousand more uh, so and many of which we haven't studied in detail at all um, but um, they're, they're, they represent a huge range. And of course, what one species can do doesn't mean another species can necessarily do. Uh, but there's a lot of really great science. So I was able to really um, make the book, I think, more convincing for the science. But also it's critical to include the, the anecdotes, the stories, because they really touch the heart. Where, where the mm -hmm. science reaches the, the mind, I think the anecdotes and the stories have more power to engage the emotions, which is vital if you want to make a book, any message convincing to a, to the, an audience. Yeah, um, and it's how researchers and and animals experience one another. And just because it's not written in a paper doesn't mean it's not um, meaningful. 
Now, something you said there really struck me, and it's also on the first page of your book, uh, that there are 33,000 uh, fish. And uh, I got to admit, when I, when I went into this, I, you know, I just thought a fish is a fish. And I was really, I mean, obviously I knew there were differences, but I was really naive to how many differences there are. And I kind of just had this, you know, you know, that stereotypical idea of a pencil drawn fish. And then you say, uh, right at the start that that number 33,000 is more than all of the amphibians, birds, and mammals combined. And reptiles. And reptiles. <laughs> and, and then you said that it's, it's 60% of all animals with a backbone. It's just, <sighs> I mean, my mind literally went through several mini explosions. Then I started to think about how much variety there is amongst mammals. I mean, you, you can't compare a human to a lion, to a zebra, to a giraffe, to a raccoon or squirrel. I mean, they're, they're so different. So how do you think we came to have, you know, such a simple understanding of what fishes, who fishes are? Well, there's a lot that could be said about that. I, my, my own pet theory is that um, we've been relatively alienated from fishes more than any of the other vertebrates because all those other ones you just listed live on land and breathe air. Uh, we can hear them. We can see them in a day-to-day -day basis, whereas fishes you can look at over an ocean, a lake, a river, what have you. And there may be tens of thousands within inches of that surface, and yet we, we, we miss them. We don't see them. We don't notice them. And it's only in the last half century with the advent of scuba gear and underwater cinematography and the like that we have been able to delve into their lives in a more sort of much more personal, intimate level. So mm -hmm. but the, the alienation also comes from not, not just being able, not, not just having a difficulty to tune into them, but also the fact that they um, have... There was a point I was going to make, and it just completely blew out of my head. Okay, I, I think I'm remembering now. The fact that they um, they don't blink, uh, that we don't hear their sounds. I have to put it that way because they're not silent. Many many species make lots of different sounds, um, but when you know the staring eyes. Uh, well, they live in, in the water. They don't need to blink the way we do or the way animals on land. I, I think these little things uh, contribute to that kind of alienation, and and they, they add fuel to those who still make the argument, such as it is, that fishes uh, are insensitive to pain and can't suffer. Um, those The numbers of people who believe that are, are dwindling, um, mm -hmm. certainly among scientists, but there are still some who, who would make that claim, even though I think the evidence clearly shows otherwise. So, um, yeah. You you dedicate a whole chapter to speaking about the idea of uh, fishes and consciousness um, and whether or not they feel pain. Uh, so I'm guessing, based on what you said, that they definitely do feel pain and they enjoy and they enjoy lives. They they feel pain and pleasure. Yeah, I mean, I, I talk about that at quite some length in the book. And I, and mm -hmm. the reason I felt it was important to have a chapter on consciousness and awareness and sentience and pain and pleasure was because there is still some debate. And there are still, you know, scientists aside, there are legions of fishermen who who cling to the belief that these animals don't feel any pain or suffering. Uh, if, if you know, it tweaks the conscience, uh, what they mm -hmm. do, if, if you're going to start believing that they are suffering and feeling pain, uh, it makes it a little tougher to uh, justify uh, catching and killing them the way we do, which, which are methods that are, they exist for convenience, not for ethical efforts to minimize their pain and suffering, unfortunately. So when we start to actually view and understand their lives and their experiences in a more meaningful way, uh, and it becomes more common knowledge that potentially this could have real world implications for how human and uh, human and fish relations. Well, one hopes. I mean, there's always a gap between the realization of the knowledge and the scientific information that shows that animals are capable of certain things and then uh, the change in our behavior. There's a lot of other forces at work, right? So, you know, fishes are killed in huge, vast numbers, astronomical numbers, um, because we want to eat them. And uh, it's uh, it's one thing to realize that they may be feeling pain and suffering, but for people to change their eating habits is a is another thing entirely. Mm -hmm. So 
yeah, it's it's incredibly thorny and prickly when you start to speak about people's food and how we eat. Uh, but when you look at the numbers of animals who are being uh, killed, I think fish are right up there, right? They they are probably the most the most exploited of all animals in terms of numbers, at least. Sure, just as they outnumber in in species diversity all the other vertebrates. If, if you if you combined all the vertebrate animals, the the other vertebrate animals, non fish that we humans kill to eat every year, it would still be uh, combined. The combined number would be just a fraction of the number of fishes that we kill uh, each year. The, the, the estimates range from a conservative end of, of a few hundred billion to uh, possibly one to two trillion. And uh, because it's difficult to estimate the numbers because the, 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 the data kept by the organizations that track these data are, are by weight and not by individuals. But if you do some math and, and look at the numbers, then at the weights, you can kind of make an estimate uh, for those figures I just gave. The numbers are unfathomable. Um, so something that you've, you've said, we've both tried to use, and I'm trying to use the word fishes. It feels kind of uh, strange. It doesn't feel grammatically correct somehow, yeah. but there's a very distinct reason for why you encourage people to use the word fishes instead of fish. Uh, could you explain? Yeah, and I don't want to sound dogmatic about it. Uh, you know, habits are habits, and we've been calling, uh, we've been using the collective term fish for, for, for many in individual fishes for a long time. And, and uh, you know, fair enough, okay, I'm, I'm not offended by that or anything, but mm -hmm. I did want to try and make the point in my book that, you know, we're talking about individuals here. Each one is unique. There are actually scientific studies of fish personalities. Uh, there's, you know, just as grains of sand even are unique, no two are the same. Well, of course, no two fishes are the same. Evolution by natural selection works on individual vari variation. So um, they're different. All of them are different. And to just call them fish, well, we do have terms like sheep and bison, for instance, for mammals that, that, that use a singular form for, a, 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 for a plural, for the plural. And... Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was just trying to make the, the case, the point that, you know, let's let's not forget um, that these are individuals. The word fishes is is perfectly acceptable and usually applied to more than one species of fish, um, but not typically used to refer to uh, more than one individual. Of course, it does get it does start to sound a bit pedantic when you talk if you talk about salmon's and cods and things like that, uh, species that are routinely used in the sing, in the singular for the plural. Um, so, you know, again, I don't want to be uh, too uh, much of a stickler about that, but it was a way to try and make the point to, to readers that, that we are talking about individuals here. Well, I think the words we use are quite uh, important. Uh, I had a conversation with someone today, so I do research on cows, and I've following uh, Catherine Gillespie, I've kind of tried to stop using the word cattle instead of cows. I mean, to use cows instead of cattle, uh, just because the etymology you know, cattle means property and it means capital. Mm. Um, but cows, even though it speaks to the, the female of the species, uh, I think it more colloquially talks to who they are as individuals, not just as, um, as you know, commodities. So I, I do, I, I don't interpret what you're asking or saying as being pedantic, but rather kind of an encouragement to think more deeply and how language shapes how we view different animals. Good. Well, let's hope that uh, other readers feel that way as well. <laughs> and, uh, by the way, I was just curious. Did you say that the word cattle is linked to the word capital? I didn't realize that. Yes. Um, I'm back now, all of a sudden, as soon as I have a direct question, I get like I second guess myself. But yeah, uh, to towards capital and property. So there are there are etymological links, um, mm. Mm. which is just really fascinating because uh, obviously cows have been um, used as a form of property relations for, for a very long time uh, and a means of trading between different people. So, yeah, I, I do think that the words we use are significant and I'm going to try and use fishes more regularly. So okay. thank you for thank you for disrupting my thought. <laughs> yeah, I, I certainly agree with you on the, the importance of how we use language with regard to animals. Uh, 
I have a lot of colleagues who are quote unquote animal people, right? They're pro animal people. They, they want the world to be a much better place for animals and they want human animal relations to be much better. And, you know, just one, you know, the, the objectification language of it, uh, I've seen captions like this, a female cardinal returns to its nest to feed its young. It's like, wait a minute, you just said it's a female. Uh, mm -hmm. so she, she's returning to her nest to feed her, to feed her young. And, and one that really gets me and gets a lot of my friends and colleagues is, is the, some criminal commits a heinous act and is describing as having act like an, acted like an animal. Mm. I mean, that's, that's a very, we, we've touched on it in some episodes. It's, it's, it's obviously a very historically loaded concept and it's a very, it's a very challenging concept for different groups of people. Uh, you know, that's been used as a way it's, it's, it's both offensive to groups of people and to animals, but to be called an animal shouldn't be a slur, but it obviously has been, because we are animals but um yeah it's just it's a really hard conversation to have just because of how the concept's been used historically yeah indeed mm. um if we could make a switch now to the the focus of the show today which is looking at the concept of shoal mates um so i was doing a bit of reading about this this morning um and in the lead up to today's interview I had no idea that a shoal and a school of fish are different to one another. Could you explain the difference? Yes, a school is a more orderly, usually unidirectional flow of fishes. So, you know, a uh, hundred million herrings in a school uh, that are migrating up to the South African coast, say, for instance, uh, would be referred to as a school. They, they have a singular purpose in mind and they're all kind of headed in the same direction in kind of an orderly unidirectional fashion. Mm -hmm. So that would be a school. Um, and then a shoal is a, a little bit more random ragtag cluster of fishes who are who are together there there there's there's definitely some you know joining staying staying amongst each other deliberately but they're kind of uh, kind of higgledy piggledy uh, they may be plucking away at, uh, mm -hmm. at, at, at algae off a coral reef and all kind of facing different directions so uh, that's a that's a better that's an example of what we call a shoal I heard a really cool metaphor uh, for explaining them where a shoal is like, imagine a group of people walking down a street in a city and they're all kind of going about their individual lives versus a group of people who are marching in a band or marching in an army lineup that there are groups of people, but their, their way of being with one another is quite different. Yeah, it's a good analogy. Mm. Um, you just mentioned herrings there. Uh, so... Herrings, I saw or read that they are always in a, a shoal. That they they never they never leave their other herrings. A herring is with all mm. the other herrings all the time. Is that is that true? Um, I put I that's I don't actually have never thought about it really. Um, I'm trying to think of any example of of herrings who when they're not swimming in a cohesive fashion in, in a school as we say. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and on the top of my head, I, I think, yeah, it does sound like perhaps they are always in schools. Uh, uh, by the same token, they, they have to mate and spawn. And I would think that during that period of their yearly existence, that they are not swimming in one direction, that they are breaking off into pairs and uh, doing the whole spawning thing on the, on the coastlines where they do that. I've seen aerial images of, um, of the aftermath of spawning of some of the most abundant species such as herring and anchovies and menhaden and the like. And uh, from, the, from the sky, there's this literally, there's this white slick from all the propagules, <laughs> all the sperm and eggs that have been released into these, the, the numbers are incredible. And, and that's, that's actually a very effective strategy for uh, species that produce lots of um, eggs and sperm is that they, um, they, they do it for synchronously. They all do it in huge numbers all at the same time. So there's an absolute glut of food for those who feed on, on say the eggs. Um, and they can't, they're overwhelmed, you know, whatever animals might be feeding on those eggs, they can't eat them all so that the, many, many of the eggs will survive for that reason. That's incredible. 
Um, you mentioned herrings uh, elsewhere in, in your book for what's a very unique, something I'd never thought of. <laughs> so you had spoken about sound and the different ways that uh, fish or different fishes can make sound. And herring have a really unique way of producing sounds. Yeah, that's right. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, sound production is, is actually an important communication tool for many species of fishes, and, and they use different parts of the body to do that. There's the, the grinding of teeth, the gnashing of teeth, the, the swim bladder, which is a, a buoyancy organ in the, in the middle of the body. I think some fishes may have several swim bladders, but in any event, uh, the, the, the organ, the swim bladder has been co-opted through evolution by a number of species as a sound producing organ because it can be resonated, uh, vibrated, it can be rubbed against neighboring uh, tissues in the body in, a, in strategic ways that produce sounds. And then you have herrings uh, who have the curious habit of releasing gases from that swim bladder uh, at certain times, and it produces a noise. It produces a sound that is used, for instance, to communicate in the dark. It seems to have sort of democratic uses where um, these frequent repetitive ticks, which is what the scientists call them, and if you do the acronym, you can probably figure out what the, the little <laughs> joke there. They These, these um, herring farts for one of a better term they uh, they allow they allow the, the fish to be more strategic in their cohesiveness and their ability to make decisions um, during nighttime when they don't want to be in certain parts of the water where predators may lurk uh, this is sort of one of the one of the functions that this this unusual uh, form of communication seems to serve and you know why do you think looking at and paying such close attention to sounds and smells and different senses you know the theme of the season is looking at experience and we've spoken about how important you know thinking about animals bodies is for looking at and understanding their experiences but you focus in on particular senses as a way of accessing and trying to understand the lives and the worlds of of fish why do you think that route is so important well, I'm really glad you're focusing on on the word experience. I, I think the, that's really where it's at. Uh, that's what makes life worth living. That's what gives color and richness to life. And I mean color in the in the in the more broad general sense. Although fishes have superb color vision, or many of them do. Um, the the experience is how our senses inform us. You know that that's what experience is, and and it's the senses that make that happen. You know, when we talk about sentience, which is a a term that unfortunately has has yet to sort of come into popular uh, use in society, uh, such an important context concept, the capacity to feel and, to, and the capacity to have experiences. Uh, to be able to feel and have experiences requires some degree of consciousness. Uh, I've recently finished writing a book about insects, flies to be exact. Uh, it's coming out in a few months. And uh, in that book, I also devote a chapter um, to a discussion about the evidence for sentience, for the capacity to feel, uh, to have experiences in insects, which is a, a tougher challenge to make that case than with fishes. But there's some mm -hmm. really intriguing science out there. And so it does appear that as science and humanity in general becomes a little bit more f informed and open-minded about animals, uh, we, we, we're realizing that the realms of experience are much broader than we thought across the swath of life. Sure, there may be life forms, maybe amoebas, bacteria, where there's no experience, although I've heard of, I've heard of certain people who will even argue that, say, bacteria may have experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, they certainly can respond to stimuli. So, you know, where do you draw the line? Most scientists draw the line on, on, on whether the animal is conscious. And, of course, that's not really drawing a line because there's a big debate about where we draw the line on consciousness. But as the great animal rights philosopher Tom Reagan used to say, wherever you draw that line, draw it in pencil because uh, new scientific discoveries are causing us to need to revisit those that line again and again and again. Consider octopuses, which are invertebrates. You know, they're, they're mollusks. Heck. You know, they're close relatives of snails and slugs, and most people are going to just wave their hand and say, forget it, I don't think snails and slugs have any feelings. There is some scientific mm -hmm. evidence to, to contradict that view, uh, but, it, but you know, they're close relatives or they're relatives in the same phylum, mollusca, the, the cephalopod mollusks, and most notably the octopuses, they show, you know, I mean, there's books being written about them that show personality and emotion and uh, 
cognitive skills and playfulness and you know qualities that we never would have thought that invertebrates have and there's some pretty interesting studies of insects that i draw attention to in my book that certainly give one pause before making any conclusion about them not having feelings or experiences oh i'm so excited to read it uh you know you make you make me think of uh, von Uxel, who I, I know you've mm -hmm. you've pulled on in your book as well and trying to understand their umwelt their their life worlds and and using senses they're you know the ways in which we don't experience the world in the same way but it doesn't mean that we can't at least strive to have some empathy or some understanding by focusing on how different animals do experience the world that's right i mean humans are not the gold standard of sensory experience when we consider how much better uh, than ours is a dog's sense of smell Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's some animals that have a sense of smell that leaves dogs in their in their wakes and uh, then the visual capacities of uh, birds of prey say uh, and the the uh, the sense of hearing of bats who can hear you know in the ultrasonic range way beyond the level that we can hear just the fact that these sensory capacities fall outside of the human bandwidth to me says that well they can experience certain conscious sentience related phenomena certain experiences uh, in a realm that we can't so we, we definitely shouldn't hold ourselves up as the sort of gold standard the the final word in in all the sensory experiences that, that creatures can have i love that you highlight the different um senses and that it goes far beyond the the five senses that we kind yes. of think about and you you delve a bit into that uh and, and you talk about, uh, you know, sight and sound and smell and taste, but you also start to speak, uh, which coming back to the idea of um, shawl and, and shawl mates, because um, you, you spoke about octopus. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> the different senses. Uh, when you spoke about shoals and thinking about shoal mates, uh, different beings that hang out with one another, a sense that seemed really important in that was uh, what you were calling pressure sensors or, or lateral lines? Sure, yeah. Fishes, uh, bony fishes, most of them have a lateral line, which is a row of sensitized scales along the midline from front to back. You can see it on a lot of fishes, uh, this line going down the middle on each side that is sensitive to uh, changing water pressures. Uh, there's the, there's a, there's little cup-like cup, a little whisker-like structure inside a cup at the very micro level of these cells along the lateral line that are very um, sensitive to changes in water flow and water pressure. So you, with the lateral line, fishes are able to sense uh, changes in the quality of water, perhaps the presence of another fish, or, and if it's a predatory fish, really good information to have if it's in the dark. And uh, depending on the context, to move toward or move away from that from that stimulus. So yeah, it's a really nice example of a sensory capacity that we don't have well developed, uh, that they have very well developed, and it's very useful for them living in an aque aqueous environment. And would they use this so when thinking about uh, fish moving together is this how you explain those kinds of striations of, of fish how they're able to move you know it seems like they're moving at the same time uh, you know thousands of fish doing something at the same time is this the sense that helps them to do that i believe it's it's implicated as one of the more important senses i think there is if it's in in light conditions of course if it's dark then vision is, is of no use but mm -hmm. um, um definitely scientists have taken a keen interest in these large coordinated movements that you see the murmurations of starlings in flight and uh, the the rapid changes of directions that they can do in such a coordinated fashion uh, and similarly, large schools of fishes, you, you, you turn on the BBC and you'll often see, you know, the so-called bait ball, which is a, a bit of a, a, of a utilitarian term for a large group of uh, these fish, small fishes who are trying to avoid being caught. And they clump, cluster together as a defense tactic, safety in numbers. And then this, this incredible swirl and the coordination with which they can move around and stay in a spherical shape or whatever shape, you know, and then splits apart when the shark or the, or the swordfish or whatever large predator swims through to try and catch one. Um, it, 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 I believe the current state of the knowledge is that it's a combination of vision if it's in the, 
if it's in the daylight. But um, probably more importantly, this, these lateral line pressure sensors where the fishes are very tuned into their neighbors. And, and there are minute delays between one individual and another changing direction. Uh, but they're so brief that we don't really notice it. And it looks like they, they move about as one. Wow, it, it, it is just, uh, sorry, I said striations just now, I meant to say murmurations. Um, it is just so incredibly beautiful to see. Uh, it's it's all inspiring when, uh, yeah, it's, it's mesmerizing. Yeah, uh, and there's, a, there's actually, sorry to interrupt you, Claudia, there's a, there's no a video that, that I recommend. Uh, I don't know the name of the video, but um, it's uh, about a three or four minute video. It's two young women who go canoeing maybe somewhere in Northern England, I have a feeling, and uh, they're, they're paddling and they, they had a camera with them. And, and just out of the blue, this massive murmuration of certainly tens of thousands, maybe more of starlings flies overhead and morphs into these wow. different shapes and they filmed it. And they're just, uh, I, I've watched that video five times and I, I get all emotional every time I watch it. It's so beautifully done. I've got goosebumps right now. Uh, just <laughs> those those kinds of chance encounters uh, where you're just exposed to the wonder and the beauty. I've seen some of those videos where you where you get a sense of bioluminescence, uh, which just blows my mind. It's like Avatar in real life. Uh, just <laughs> the idea that you could see people walking through waves, and every step they take, there there's these like bioluminescent. Uh, um, it's Al just algae, beautiful. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the ocean certainly has these lovely uh, blooms of uh, bioluminescent algae from time to time. And the, the visual effect is, yes, yeah, stunning and, and hard to describe without seeing it. Yeah, uh, absolutely incredible. Uh, so when we think about fish encountering one another and being in social groups, uh, would a shoal only be fish of the same species or are we talking here about uh you know fishes interacting across species lines it's an important question uh, it gets into interspecies communication and interspecies behaviors and, in, and interactions um I, I as far as i know these these schooling species that are noted for their massive schools the uh, the herrings and menhadens and sardines and, and those sorts of ones i i don't know if they form mixed species schools it wouldn't surprise me it certainly happens you there's certainly mis, mixed flocks of birds for instance who uh, benefit from being amongst different species that have more developed senses in certain realms and so they complement each other for being vigilant uh, certainly fishes on reefs forage together in mixed species groups. Um, one of my favorite examples of, of mixed species interactions is between grouper and more, groupers and moray eels, which are two mm -hmm. predatory fishes on reefs. And um, yeah, now, now we're talking about individuals, but um, they, they team up and they hunt together for uh, on, on the reef. And because their, their styles of hunting are complementary, they they do much better at catching food over a certain time period if they collaborate than if they work individually. The moray eel is a slippery, slender creature that can swim into nooks and crannies in the reef, thereby catching or chasing out a, a little fish who, who goes to hide there. And if the fish manages to escape the moray eel and gets out into the open water, well, of course, the grouper is, is waiting. And it's a pretty sophisticated collaboration because it involves referential signaling in which the grouper invites the moray eel and not just any old moray eel. Studies have shown that they have their favorites and they go and invite them. They know where they live. And, and if they're both in the mood to, to feed, they, they head off together, swimming in very close together, and then they perform their feats. And, and groupers will point to a, a fish who's escaped in the reef for over 20 minutes sometimes, trying to get that moray nearby to come and uh, chase, chase it out. <laughs> And uh, the grouper will sometimes swim over and, and, and signal to the moray to sort of come come over. I mean, it's a very intentional type of behavior that speaks to an animal who is not just aware, but remarkably intelligent and, uh, mm. and, and forward thinking, forward planning. thinking and resourceful and planning. Yeah, a lot of what fishes mm. do indicates that they're thinking ahead. They know what they are. They already have their plan worked out. Oh, unbelievable. And another another uh, interaction that blew my mind was when you were speaking about sunfish and they have a whole it seems like a whole range of social relationships beyond their own species uh, yeah you, sure you, you sure mm -hmm. yeah there's a there's actually i just want to mention there's a new book about uh, sunfish 
uh, the ocean sunfish, uh, just just coming out by a, a friend and colleague of mine named Tierney T. S. T. H. Y. S. is her last name, and uh, I believe it's a scholarly book, so it's pretty expensive, unfortunately. But uh, uh, I'm sure it's going to be packed with a lot of really inf interesting information about how these massive uh, it's the it's the largest of the bony fishes of, in the oceans, I believe. The the mola mola, a, a really big old one. It could be a century old. Would can weigh <gasps> over two tons. And uh, yeah, they're known for for occasionally or, or probably regularly um, coming to the surface and swimming, lying on their side. They're they're flattened. They're kind of flattened. They're a big disc-shaped fish and very bizarre. They're in the pufferfish family, and they'll lie on their side to solicit parasite removal services from gulls who have gathered on the on the surface of the ocean. And so the, the, both species know the know the know the drill. And so the, the sunfish cooperates by exposing his or her sides to these uh, gulls. And the gulls get food because they can pluck out these sometimes quite large ocean copepods and sea lice from the skin. So the uh, it's a classic mutualism. And this time between a fish and a bird where the fish gets a parasite removal service and the gulls get some food. That example just blows my mind. Uh, you know, it means the fish fishes were looking up at some points and saw birds and saw an opportunity or exactly. like, how did that first how did that first experience happen and how is that passed down in between different groups of uh, fishes and birds i wish i knew uh, you know that question is is one i often ask myself when i see examples of complex behavior you think you know who who was the Einstein fish who first came up with this idea? You know, somebody had to sort of kind of do it first. It, it's just, it has, there has to be a first for everything. And, uh, you know, I think a, a lot of these behaviors maybe evolve in stages, but there's also critical steps, critical stages. You know, the, the grouper who first shakes his or her head is an invitation to a moray eel. Uh, the 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 ocean sunfish who first went up and swam on its side to make it easier for gulls mm. to you know, the, the, all these behaviors, and it does speak to the remarkable flexibility, intelligence, opportunism of not just evolution and natural selection, but the individuals who make up populations of animals. Yeah, because it takes someone to both make make a communicative gesture and someone else to receive it and accept it. Uh, you know, someone to, I mean, I think we've all had probably similar experiences with our cats and our dogs who, who are in our communities where they do something odd and you're trying to figure it out. You're like, what do you mean by this? What are you trying to tell me? And then you have that moment when it clicks and you're like, uh-huh. And the next time you they do X with their body, you you know what it means. You start to get a sense of the different looks and the different, and I think, yeah, you start to just deve develop a language between between you across species, which is just unbelievable. Yeah, little wonder now that uh, dogs, domestic dogs, have become surprisingly only recently, but they've become uh, the darlings of a lot of uh, ethology research on animal social behavior because we we know them so well, we can read their signals so well, and vice versa. You know, they've been living mm. with us for fifteen thousand or so years, and so there's a very well developed, uh, intuitive, uh, sensory connection between the two species. Yeah, it's it's great. Uh, so, so we are clocking, if you can believe it, we're already at 45 minutes. Uh, it's what a great conversation. I, I just wanted to come back to the, the concept of, of shoal mates. So we haven't really spoken about it as, as a concept per se, um, which is totally, totally fine. Uh, but I just wanted to maybe get into a bit of a philosophical thought experiment with you here. Where, what do you think the value would be of starting to use words like shoalmates to actually think through the experiences of animals? Well, first of all, I think it's a nice uh, little uh, cute phrase because it, it, it you know links to our expression of soulmates. And so right off the bat, I, you know, if you can get people chuckling, I think that can be a good, a good way to get them engaged. So I like it for that. I like that it resonates with our term soulmates. But um, you know, shoalmates imp implies uh, what, what a lot of what we've been talking about, which is that uh, fishes recognize each other as individuals. We haven't explicitly talked about that, but I can tell you that science has supported that, uh, that some fishes recognize humans as individuals, even just by our faces. So 
uh, showmates requires the concept if, 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 you know, the way I think of it is, is one individual fish having a particular affinity and connection to one other, another individual fish. And uh, it could be that as, as simple as fishes teaming up to mate once a year or at some point in their life. And it may be, they may be relatively solitary and certainly large predatory fishes or predatory fishes of many sizes fit that bill sharks and and pelagic uh, predators and what have you but um it, it when i think of the big schooling species such as the herrings and the sardines and such uh, i i think uh, you know i see pictures of their schools or i see film of them swimming by in massive huge numbers and you think that does does any of them know any of the others? Do they sort of mm-hmm. stay with a mini shoal with or mini school within the school? I don't know, and I don't know if anyone studied that. But you got to figure, um, you know, the fact that herrings, you know, will stop swimming and and they will hang out and they will communicate with 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 gas bubbles released <laughs> released from their swim bladders. Uh, you got to figure there's there's a lot more going on than just uh, I'm just a herring among all these other herring, and the fact that they pair off to mate tells me also there's a lot more going on. So while we may not have as as uh, as complex a view of those types of species as we do, um, you know, species like moray eels and groupers and surgeon fishes and what have you, uh, nevertheless there's probably a lot more going on than we realize. So would it, would a shoalmate though only be then someone who's engaged in like those big groups like herrings and stuff, or would it also be? Could you call a sunfish and a gull a shoalmate? Uh, could you call? Could you call uh, the cleaner? Is it called the cleaneress that you yeah. you talk about? Um, and their clients would they be shoalmates, or is it only those who swim together? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I was talking about things like herrings because they're probably not the best example. We we've already established that they generally swim in schools, not shoals. So so yes, I I, I think it'd be more, a more apt example of shoalmates would might be a pair or a trio or more of uh, cleaner wrasses who work together day after day as a team on a particular spot on the reef where they serve as client fish who line up to wait their turn to have parasites removed in exchange for food for the cleaners. Uh, though Those fit the bill much more closely to shoalmates. Uh, whether sunfishes, for instance, ever sort of identify and recognize and team up with particular gulls, uh, I would I would suspect not because it's probably not often that they're engaging in that interaction and the, they swim far and wide and they'd be at different locations. But I don't know for sure. And uh, you know, the, 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 it's so often the case that when we when we think something couldn't be happening, the next thing you find out is animals are actually doing it. So so okay. cer- certainly I I did mention uh, the the moray eel collaboration with groupers. And that that's that's individual specific. That there's there's okay. captive studies have shown that moray eels uh, or I should say groupers will remember a cooperative versus an uncooperative moray eel from the day before, and they will choose the cooperative one over the uncooperative one. So that suggests to me also shoal mates of different species. Well, okay, so I'm I'm, I'm with you now. Where where we're looking at individuals making connections with other individuals time and again they're they're making a concerted effort to be with each other whether it's for pleasure or work uh they choose each other yes that's oh. right yep i see why soulmates and shoalmates is uh quite beautiful now uh well thank you thank you so much for all of these these great anecdotes uh we're approaching the end now, and I just wanted to give you an opportunity to read a quote. Uh, the intention with reading a quote is normally to give, uh, you know, someone an opportunity to either highlight a portion of their work or someone else's work that they think speaks to uh, either the theme of today's episode or the theme of the season, which is animals and experience. Well, I appreciate the invitation to share a quote. I, I, I have one from my book, What a Fish Knows. I, it's a it's a short paragraph and not a sentence. Is that acceptable or did you just want a sentence? Nope, that's totally acceptable. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, just to provide a little context, it gets back to what we just mentioned about cleaner client, uh, the cleaner client mutualism, where cleaner fishes, cleaner wrasses uh, service so-called client fishes of more than a hundred known species on the on the reef, and they remove parasites in exchange for getting some. Uh, the the clients get the spa treatment and the parasite removal service, and the cleaners get food. So this is just one paragraph in one aspect of that. 
clients are not passive participants. When it is their turn, they approach the cleaning station and hover in place, spreading their fins to help cleaners reach all the nooks and crannies. Some open their mouths and gill covers to allow the usually much smaller cleaners to enter and exit. A cleaner will sometimes butt her snout against fins and gill covers to signal the client to spread them for inspection. Cleaners also vibrate their ventral fins so that they can tap against the host's body in a signal that says, please keep this part of your body still for inspection. What? Yeah, I like that. They're, they just they're able to tell what? They're able to tell other fish to stay still? Well, that's that's how we interpret it. That, you know, that that seems to be what they're doing. Yeah, there's no there's no other really clear interpretation for that behavior. Wow, they're amazing. Uh, where where do you find these uh, cleaner ass? Where where are they? I think uh, they, there's a number of different species around the world, but they're they're pretty widespread. I've I've seen them snorkeling in Hawaii, and I know they they occur in the Red Sea, which is a long way from Hawaii. Hawaii. Uh, I'm sure there's there's some. I'm pretty sure there must be some on the Great Barrier Reef, which is also a huge distance away. So I think they're they're fairly cosmopolitan. I uh, wouldn't be surprised if they're found on all reefs around the world. I think of reefs as like cities. They are they are like little cities and. Now I'm imagining cleaner ass going to work each day and they make their little work teams and, uh, and yeah, they're working for a living and their pay is their food. It's That's a really nice analogy, the city analogy. And some of these cities are megalopolises like the Great Barrier Reef, which is, uh, you know, I forget how long, 2,200 miles or something like that, uh, a very huge swath of reef. Um, and so it, it is quite a good analogy to compare them to cities. Yeah, and, and I liked that you brought up work earlier on in the episode because I do think that it starts to, if we kind of remove the idea of money exchange, I think when you start to look at animals and some of what they do with the lens of work and working with others as, as shoalmates, it starts to really just illuminate the way you think. You see geese walking from a pond to you know, to the grass to go and eat, and they do so together. It's it's quite clearly a form of work and working together. It's it's unbelievable. Uh, no, it is believable. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's another way that we can relate uh, their their daily existence. They may not uh, think of it as work the way we do. Uh, they may not be paid a salary the way we are. Hopefully, for our work. Uh, but in terms of having things on your list that need to get done that day and going from one place to another to get it done to, to a better place, say, and uh, be coordinating with others of your kind or others of different kinds, there's very strong parallels to the, the work and careers of, of mm. humans and those of other species. And would you say that these are quite like routine when you see fishes engaging in these types of behaviors? Is it, you know, there's a particular time of day and this is when we do, you know, this is when we do this type of work? Uh, or does it seem quite random, uh, you know, in thinking about animals' experiences and shoals, is there structure to the day? Very much so. Very much a lot of routines, which is not to imply necessarily that it's drudgery, but certainly there's structure to the animal's day, uh, depending on the species. You know, the day may vary more, in, perhaps for predatory fishes, when, when they may go for days without needing to eat, and then they get hungry, and they have to have a very different day ahead of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, you know, another relevant concept here is, is culture, and, and culture has been shown to exist in fish populations as well. Culture being defined in this case as... Uh, phenomena, behaviors that are not heritable. They're not passed on through the genes. They're passed on through teaching, through observation, through other social forms during the animal's uh, life. And uh, that's certainly been demonstrated in, in fishes as well. Last question. Do you have an example of a really great teacher fish? So a, a fish story that tells us how fishes teach each other. Sure. I mean, I could give a, I could give an anecdote, or I could give a scientific study. Do you, do you have a preference? Both. <laughs> Both. <laughs> well, I'll start out with the, the anecdote, um, which uh, one can watch YouTube videos that show the same, t same types of phenomena, and it's the, it's the connection and the trust that can be forged between a human and a fish. And uh, the one particular example that I re relate in my book, although I probably relate more uh, several, um, in fact, I know I do, but certainly this one um, 
was described to me by a woman living in Florida. She's describing her relationship with her discus fish, which is a popular aquarium fish. Uh, I don't like to call them a pr- aquarium fish. Uh, popular for aquarium enthusiasts. I don't mm-hmm. want to. Uh, I don't want to promote aquariums actually. But and there's a there's a new film called the uh, the um, the dark hobby. I had to remember the film that's all about the aquarium trade and the troubles of that. Anyway, back to the point. Uh, Jasper was a, a blue discus fish. I met discus fishes; they're very beautiful, and uh, he formed quite a connection, quite a quite a bond with uh, Karen, his human caregiver. Uh, she would go out to work and come home, and when she'd arrive at home, she'd always go straight to the tank and interact with Jasper, who appeared to appreciate that. And they would uh, she'd she'd move back and forth in front of the the tank, and Jasper would swim back and forth rapidly uh, in unison with her, and uh, so from time to time, she would cup her hands and put them in the water, a few inches under the water, and Jasper would swim over and, and literally swim onto his side where she could use her thumbs to stroke his body, to gently caress him. And he, he clearly liked that. And there's plenty of evidence for fishes uh, really enjoying uh, the power of touch and getting stress relief from that. So it was a really nice connection with them. And of course, it makes it that much harder when they die. Oh, and yeah, so Jasper and Karen are shoalmates. They that's right. They, they choose one another. Uh, uh, yeah, the the idea of fish coming for cuddles. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's it's, exactly what it is. And you can see film of some some captive fishes who are, trust the human to pick them up out of the water for a few seconds, and while they pet them and then toss them gently back in, and the fish swims back for more. So the fact that they come back for more tells me that they're enjoying it. The capacity of other animals to trust sometimes also just, uh, you would think that by now they would kind of, I know that there are many that are wary of us and are constantly wary, but the the ability for trust to form across species uh, like that, to be able to be lifted out of the water and be caressed and touched and know that you'll be put back in is just, it actually makes me a bit emotional. It's kind of, it's what a beautiful idea. Yeah, and it would be very easy to study the the level the the, the phenomenon of trust in the sense that if you put take another human uh, who would perform the same behaviors to solicit uh, the interaction, such as cupping the hands and seeing if Jasper swims in. I don't know if Karen ever did that with a friend, uh, but uh, it would be interesting to see how Jasper would have responded to someone else. Uh, yeah. uh, these things are probable. You can you can study them, and I don't know what the science would say on that. It'd be interesting to find out. That would be interesting. Um, do you want to give us your scientific example? Sure, because it does actually link to the same the same thing. It actually links to a behavior in this cleaner client relations, where client fishes will sometimes pause from their parasite removal and actually caress uh, cleaner uh, clients. Cleaner fishes will caress their clients with their by fluttering their pectoral skin, fins against their skin. Uh, it may be a way to mollify uh, clients who are unhappy with some shoddy cleaning treatment, which may include mucus nipping, and that's a whole other part of the uh, relationship that, that gets Machiavellian. Uh, but it, it, the particular study I wanted to mention was with surgeon fishes who were stressed by being put in shallow water. They were caught from the Great Barrier Reef and then stressed. You can measure stress by taking a small blood sample from the tail vein and uh, cortisol levels were very high in these stressed fishes. And then they gave them the opportunity to get stress relief by putting them in a tank with a very realistic model of a cleaner wrasse. Uh, uh, one, one group of fish were, had the opportunity of getting strokes by swimming next to this cleaner wrasse because the wrasse was uh, connected to a motor which caused the model to move back and forth in a gentle sweeping motion. And the other control group, the, they, their model RAS was not connected to a motor, so it didn't move. And the difference between the two treatments was striking uh, the stressed surgeon fishes who were put in the tank with the move with the mobile RAS model swam up to it uh, many, many times during the hour trials, fi- an average of 15 times per hour, and swam next to it so they could get these stress, these strokes, and their stress levels markedly dropped during this period. The control group where they couldn't get caresses, they ignored the the cleaner RAS model. They didn't touch it once. They averaged zero contacts per hour compared to 15 contacts per hour. Wow. And their stress levels didn't drop uh, the way the other ones did. So very, to me, a very, very pretty strong demonstration of 
not just stress, stress, of course, but to the ability to, or the wherewithal to seek stress relief and to get stress mm -hmm. relief from something that we can relate to a, a massage or, or the, the power of touch, you know, a car a caressing can be very stress relieving. We know that from going and getting professional massages, for instance. So or just hugs. Or just, a hug. or just or just hugs and and then mm -hmm. and then the I'm happy to say that these surgeon surgeon fishes were released back into their home turfs on the uh, Great Barrier Reef following the study. So, so that is I, I know I said the last question was the last question, but there is one more. <laughs> when you when you meld together some of these stories and scientific experiments, how do you navigate the the ethics of this all? Uh, you know, some of the experiments you spoke about in the book where research has been done on fish seem, you know, fairly invasive and, and, and harmful for, for those involved. As, as a researcher and someone who, or as, a, as an author and someone who writes and obviously cares quite deeply about fishes and the ways they experience the world, how do you navigate that tension between using science that's treated them badly, but also found out really important information about how they experience the world? Yeah, uh, it's it's a very important question and a bit of a conundrum, a uh, bit of a challenge. Uh, I, I usually take pains to inform my readers or my audiences that I, I don't uh, mean to endorse these studies by describing them necessarily. Uh, nevertheless, as somebody who's trying to synthesize information and to make a case for a better treatment of a group of animals, in this case fishes, um, I will use whatever tools are out there. And since those studies have already been done and I have no control over their being done or not, um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I will draw from them. And uh, I may include a disclaimer about I'm not necessarily recommending this, this study or, or expressing sympathy for the fishes in the study. Nevertheless, uh, if their futures can be made more secure by citing these studies and mentioning them and describing them, then I, I will do that. Great. Um, I think that's really good. I've, I've been contending with some of these own, these tensions myself. Uh, and yeah, I think that's really a, a great way forward. There's only so much each of us can do. And I think you're doing wonderful work for, for fishers and for helping us understand a world uh, that was quite murky. Uh, so I really encourage anyone to, to, to head out and get your get your book. Uh, before we close, is there anything you'd like to share with folks? Maybe uh, you mentioned a book that you're working on or where they could come and find out more about you and the work you do? Uh, sure, people can always go to my website, jonathan-balcom.com and uh, they can find out about my earlier books or my next book, Superfly. Uh, they can also sign up for a monthly newsletter called All Things Fish, although it's becoming All Things Fish and Insects, and uh, and uh, keep in touch that way. So I, I encourage people to, to pursue these types of information and learn more and uh, hopefully improve our relationships with them. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time today, and uh, I hope you have a lovely day. Thanks, Claudia. I really enjoyed it. All right, everybody, that is season two, episode eight done. Thank you once again to Jonathan for being a fantastic guest, to Gordon Clark for the bed music, to Jeremy John for the logo, and to Animals and Philosophy, Politics, Law and Ethics, Apple, for sponsoring this podcast. We won't get another episode out this year. Uh, I thought I had big dreams that I was going to have season two done in 2020, but alas, deadlines have been moved and things have shifted. So you'll get the last two episodes in January. For now, I want to wish you a happy end of the year, whatever you're doing. Uh, big celebrations, happy, happy, uh, all of that good stuff. I hope that you get some rest uh, too, and I'll check in with you in the new year. This is The Animal Turn with me, Claudia Hertzenfelder. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com.